Hi guys, I'm Anna and I'm going to review the main points of The Problem of Speaking for Others by Linda Martine Alcoff. I'm using Powtoons for the animation and Audacity for the audio, both of which are free softwares. This article is based on the premise that there is a problem with speaking for others. Even when we assume the speaker's intent is liberation for an oppressed group of which they are not a part, when they speak for others, they still get it wrong drown out the voices of the actual subjects, and get all of the credit for what they've said. It also makes it seem as if there's some good reason why the group members aren't speaking for themselves, or like we can get all of the information without them. If people from dominant groups give credibility to a cause, it reinforces the idea that they're the ones with credibility to give. Unanswerable questions start to arise when one attempts not to speak for others. For example, there's the question of intersectionality. There are many aspects of ourselves which affect our experiences and by which we define ourselves, so which group markers do we pay attention to? In any group of people, you will find differences between individuals. So if we follow the idea of not speaking for others far enough, our intersectionality will lead us to groups of one. A second unanswerable question is how do we locate ourselves in a group when our identities are animated and malleable things? A person may be unsure whether they do fit in a group, or they may fit into different groups at different times in their life. I'll call the third unanswerable question the failure of alliance. If we can't speak for one another, how do we speak up for one another? Does this mean that it's impossible to be an ally? The fourth question falls under essentialization. Does a specific identity always confer authority? If I should not speak for others, should I restrict myself to following their lead uncritically? What if a person who is less privileged than me is saying something I think is wrong or is oppressing another person less privileged than them? The final unanswerable question is the question of individuality. The entire idea that I can be an entity separate from my surroundings goes against the theoretical underpinnings that our place in the world has bearings on who we are and what we mean. When I talk about myself, am I still speaking for others? Do my words still affect and mediate their experiences and their understandings of one another? When a person speaks about themselves, can they still be a mouthpiece for the ideas that others have formed about them? Try to think of a time when you came up against one of these questions in a personal choice or interaction. What did it feel like? Luckily for us, Linda Martine Alcoff has some suggestions for how to proceed under these paralyzing moral issues. But before we get to those, let's review the conceptual bases for her arguments. The first basis is the rituals of speaking, and the part that is interesting to me is that it doesn't matter just who is speaking and to whom, but the way in which they have been trained to speak and with what groups that manner or ritual of speaking is associated that manner bears on the meaning and truth of what they say. The second basis is that, in Alcott's words, rituals of speaking are differentially related in complex ways to structures of oppression. Without the recognition that oppression is woven into the fabric of our society, all of this is meaningless and could actually be used to silence a member of an oppressed group trying to be heard. Our penultimate basis is the danger of reductionism. Who is speaking how and to whom does not define the truth and meaning of what is said. Those things only have a bearing on the meaning and truth of what is said. And finally, especially if you come from a place of power, it's not okay to stop speaking completely. Maintaining silence is another way of maintaining power. She says, errors are unavoidable in the heretical inquiry as well as political struggle, and they usually make contributions. This brings us to our fourth and final part, the necessary questions.
Before engaging in discourse, remember this. Step up and step back. When you are speaking with a group, you can share the power. Know thyself. Think about the possible connection between your location and your words. Take feedback on this and don't leave the work up to others to analyze the privilege in your speech. Be accountable for what you say. When you receive negative feedback, take that into consideration and learn from it. And let history guide you. We aren't operating in a vacuum. We can learn what has already happened and some of what our words could mean in that context. Can you tell what these four points have in common? Well, for one, they all require constant doubt, questioning, and learning. If you're immersed in self-doubt and hatred at this point, congratulations! That means you're succeeding. But if you have feelings of mastery and success, please check your privilege. Thank you for joining me in this review of The Problem of Speaking for Others by Linda Martine Alcock. Stay in flux, my friends. Created using Powtoon.